What do you know about 3D printing in the production environment? Well, we all know that these machines have been used uh, in prototyping for many, many years, but have they and can they be used for production purposes? Well, that's what we're talking about today on Swarf and Chips. Okay, we're not cutting metal today, we're printing it. I'm on my way to Dartford, I'm just about to jump on public transport for the first time in a while and head to Printing Portal and meet with the owner and the founder of this business. He's also an entrepreneur, he started the company six years ago and he's going to talk to me about how this disruptive technology has had a huge impact, uh, not just on the success of his business, but manufacturing in general. Printing Portal started about six years ago um, after, um, a, well, it was quite a, a long decision process of leaving uh, a, a, good, a good job in the city. So um, I've been at um, a bank for six years, um, but all my family are entre entrepreneurial based. I was a bit of a, a bit the black sheep for working in the city. Um, and I knew I wanted to start a business. Flushing it out, it was going to be 3D printing. Uh, for me, uh, after speaking to a good friend of mine who's an industrial designer, um, and uh, you know, I'd left the city and uh, started learning CAD in a, in a barn for six months before Printing Portal really became founded and uh, got it off its feet. I was really also interested to find out what excited James about 3D printing. I guess, for, so coming from the bank, um, there's nothing tangible to uh, what, you're, what you're making, you know, that you can't really see or feel. Uh, any of the um, your your products of your labour. So for me, what was interesting was actually producing something that you could feel and touch, um, uh, and, and providing that to our customers. Main types of three D printing, I guess, is is you know there's a couple of th uh, processes that's quite familiar to people, which would be FDM. So it's extrusion of plastic um, uh, layer by layer. You had um, SLA, which was a resin based photopolymer. Uh, which is actually the first machines I, I delved into, which is the first machine we bought for Printing Portal. Um, uh, to more of your you know, serious industrial type applications which, uh, or, or uh, machines which are SLS and, and, and now MJF. So Nick, what's your role here at uh, Printing Portal? Cool. Uh, I am the head of additive manufacturing here at Printing Portal. Uh, I advise customers and uh, how best to produce their parts, whether that be in FDM uh, or MJF. Uh, so from there we can decide uh, if they want to go into manufacture or they're doing it as prototypes that we best advise them how to uh, get their parts made for them. Now you've got a lot of experience in this area and this is what today's show is about, learning about how mm -hmm. 3D printing is advancing. Let's get inside this HP machine if you want to lift the lid sure. and maybe you could talk us through some of the elements in here, how it works, what the advantages are to uh, this type of solution compared to SLS and, and what the component tree is in here. But to SLS, uh, this uses uh, standard 2D print technology, much like for paper printers, uh, but it uses print heads as well as light uh, and heat to create its plastic parts. Okay, so what we see in here, what's at the top of the machine? At the top here we have the heating lamps, uh, which produce enough heat so it uh, gets the PA12 or nylon, uh, depending on which material you're using up to, it's close to its material melting point. And from there, uh, detailing agent and fusing agent is applied to create your parts. Right, so the MGF technology, what's the, what's the biggest selling aspect in your opinion to this and in how the technology is advancing? In my opinion, it's because depending on how many parts are in the build, it will always print at the same speed. So you can have 10 parts in there or 1,000 parts. As long as they're at the same build height, it will still print at the same time. So taking us now into production. So uh, multi-jet fusion by HP is a relatively newcomer to the, the 3D printing markets. Um, I had to do a fair bit of research on it because you know, with anything that's new, you, you, you need to uh, get a real understanding as to what its capabilities were, what its drawbacks could be. 
Um, I'd been to um, uh, an SLS provider in, in Germany and I'd seen the processes and I'd seen uh, the levels of uh, input that goes into creating the parts. Uh, and I'd also had a very good supplier here in the UK, um, Matsura, who allowed us to do a lot of benching, uh, benchmarking with, with MJF. Um, after comparing the two, um, I felt that MJF offered a very fast and adaptable process for us to produce um, a, cu a couple of materials um, that we knew were very popular in the 3D printing market. Um, and combined with the level of service that we received from, from the supplier and the, uh, the post-processing setup, which I compared directly with SLS, I chose, I chose uh, MJF. And for us, it's been a great fit. Uh, in here at the moment, uh, this is a completely naturally cooled print. So from here, we can actually take out the parts. And from here, we could move on to the post-processing for the part. Right. Now, what about the cooling is one aspect of mm -hmm. 3D printing that's often been a barrier for people. What if you need to cool it or you can't cool it fast enough? Is there a mechanism here to do that? Sure. With the MJF technology and HP's uh, production, what we can do is actually force cool builds under certain circumstances to get the customer their parts even quicker. Right, so you can, you can force cooling can to force make, cool the parts, again, yes. you're bringing production into, into mm. reality here. Um, so this is like a hoover then, is yes, it? Would you, yep. would you be then hoovering around to pick up the, what we class as the remnant or the, uh, the, you know, the, the rest of the uh, excess material? Yeah, sure. We, um, we recycle the excess material that is around the parts. We can um, recycle up to 80% of an entire build unit material that isn't used. So you can recycle 80% to, yep. to make, go towards so making the next... Ne next build, yes. Okay, now this is what we would have taken out here. If, mm -hmm. if you can maybe hold that one, Nick, because sure. you've got the gloves on there. Yep. These are what would have come out. And how many come out of this station? In this build, there is 10 of these. And this can print in about five hours, I believe. So we're really heavily involved in the automotive and the engineering uh, and marine world, uh, particularly in the UK. Um, but we also touch on medical parts and... Um, uh, your general consumer goods. So we're finding that um, most of our work is tilted towards production grade parts. Um, previously, when I mean when, when I started the business, we did a lot of design and, and prototyping work, um, possibly because of the type of machines we had in house. Um, where we've moved, when we moved to the MJF machines, we realised we actually had the capacity, and there was a requirement from you know general industry for. Um, uh, production grade parts. You know, these are parts that are going into the final processes being used in a production grade setting. Um, and uh, jumping from, you know, the SLA that we typically had in the FDM into MJF allowed us to supply that to, to the customers. And, and even now on a daily basis, we're, we're teaching customers um, the ability to um, use multi-jet fusion parts in a production setting. So Nick, we're now looking at the Dimension Power Shot, which again is supplied by Matsura here as a, com a complete solution for you. This is what we just looked at that was in the post-processing um, phase. So what happens now? So from here, once it's been depowdered in the processing unit, it's uh, brought over to here into the Power Shot C. From here, it literally just goes into this tumbler. Then it's an automatic sandblaster. So it actually takes uh, a man away from manually sandblasting into a fully automated... Uh, Production. Okay, so what would be the comparative time? Let's look at, because I know you, you've actually got your Euro Blast here. How yep. long would it have taken you to do one in there compared to maybe one in here? I would say from a full build, it takes us about, about three hours to manually blast it. But in here, we can do it in under 10 to 15 minutes. And for those that aren't aware, this is actually what is one that's been blasted. So yep. what, what, what's the blasting for? I mean, it might sound obvious, mm. but mm. What, what are you actually achieving by blasting? So what we're doing is taking the residual powder off the parts. So from there, they can either go straight to the customer or they can go into further post-processing. Okay, now that's the next part of the process that we're going to talk about because uh, then if you move this way, Nick, you, you're talking about dyeing the product yes. then, aren't you? You can offer this as well, mm -hmm. again from Dimension. So yes. what's that process? Uh, so what happens is we go into a machine called the DM60. The DM60 is a fully pressurised pure dyeing process. It involves a lot of uh, cartridges of different colours. So uh, Dimension have produced uh, an entire range uh, for the MJF materials. Right, and why would you want to dye a product? I mean, let's, let's go back to basics in a sense. What does it give the end product by it being dyed? It actually gives the end product a real value. As we do a lot of stuff for automotive, it actually becomes an end user product. 
So instead of just being the raw grey material, we can actually have it in black, grey, browns and reds. And, and, and does this process affect the integrity of the component? Does it affect the strength? Does it give you any additional advantages as well? In terms of advantages, it would give you a better appearance, obviously. Uh, but then what it can do is can actually uh, re-emulsify the molecules inside of the plastic and actually give you slightly more elastic elasticity. Okay, okay. Now, this is the final machine that we're going to talk about here now, and this is the final part of, of the process, isn't it? This is the dimension power shot. I'm going to pick up one of these parts here because... We have now got an example here of a part that has been dyed. Yes. And then they would go into this machine for what? Uh, it goes into this machine to be polished. So what it does is it shoots uh, more plastic beads at the part, and on impact they explode, and actually shot peening the exterior of the part. This gives it a nice deep sheen to the material, also uh, stops scratching. And how else would you have done this before? It wouldn't have been possible before. I'd say I'm probably a relative newcomer, being five, six years in, in the industry. Um, but I have seen, one thing I've really found fascinating is how people are using this uh, technology for production grade parts now. So previously, you know, as I said before, we, we were looking at prototyping predominantly. Um, now people understand that you know, out to 1,000, even up to our, our biggest job was for 50,000 units during the, the pandemic. And I think, that's, I think the pandemic itself, uh, the coronavirus pandemic, um, was a great illustration of the reactivity that the industry can provide um, in certain circumstances. So, you know, within a very short period, we were making thousands of face shields um, and, you know, as I said, 50,000 double clips to help face mask wearers uh, wear them more comfortably. Now, to do that in other technologies would have taken a couple of weeks to set up tools some, in some instances, um, and it did do. So we actually, we played a pivotal uh, part in providing a stopgap uh, before, before tools were created uh, for injection moulding uh, and the like to pr provide the industry with a, with a rapid response. 